I want you to understand that in the place where we are, God is still God. The same God that has continued to supply for your needs in the quarantine, he's not just supplying for food and shelter. God is able to meet every other need undisturbed. He's not changed by the times. He's not moved by the times. He still can provide and bring you somebody. But I also want you to understand, for you to be able to navigate in this area, you have to know that it's going to be different for you. You have to be spiritually sensitive and you have to understand the way God is going to work with you. I want to just say to you, if your marriage is God-centered, your marriage is going to succeed. If you allow God to be the centerpiece of your marriage, decisions are made with him, you consider him, you pray, you ask him to guide you, then you are going to succeed in your marriage. If there is no respect for your husband, whatever else you put into it, it's not going to survive. And it's not going to be a sweet experience if there is no love for the wife. If you do not show love, I know you say, I love her, that's why she's married to me. But if you do not show it in tangible ways, practical ways, then your marriage is not going to survive. And this is the one thing that Abraham did right. He loved the wife even when they went through the challenges that they went through. To start by talking a little bit about uh, relationships, and uh, then I'll come back and talk about families. Uh, my time today, most of it will be spent uh, on families. Uh, <clears throat> but I just want to introduce uh, by saying that uh, of all the areas that I know have been impacted is uh, the singles, especially the mature singles that were looking forward to sometime this year finding somebody or sometime this year maturing their relationship to where it will become a marriage uh, sometime in the near future. So this actually has, a, there has been an impact in those relationships, in those individuals' lives. They have been impacted and uh, some of it is not really in, in a negative way, but the impact, I can say that the impact that has been there has uh, largely been um, just having, just having, um, just having, seeing a difference. There has been um, a difference in the way people interact. It's just being thrown into an area where you do not know what to do. It's not necessarily scary, but what it is is just a strange environment where people have been thrown into, and I just want to highlight some of those. Now, because of the lack of physical contact, uh, needless to say, those that are going to find a spouse, the believers that are going to find somebody, are probably going to find somebody somewhere else uh, outside of physical gatherings or meetings. So those people that are going to meet a future spouse or are meeting a future spouse are going to do that in the virtual space than with physical, the typical uh, physical interactions of the past. When I was growing up, <clears throat> we had uh, physical interactions. When I was growing up, we used to uh, meet in a, in a limited sense. Uh, over the last uh, maybe 20 years, uh, people have been meeting more often and physically with very few boundaries. Uh, I don't think that's a very positive thing, but there has well, some necessary changes. Uh, some of it we have pushed it to the other side. But now this is the other extreme where sometimes uh, you, you desire to meet with somebody, but you'll not be able to do so because the church is not gathering, the church is not meeting, and finding new people now has become a real challenge. So you have to decide. You have to decide. I know many of you uh, that are looking for relationships, you have probably never thought of going online and meeting and talking to people on the phone or online, but this is something that I, I want you to know that now those that are looking are probably going to be looking more uh, online and those that are actually going to be meeting probably are going to do that in the, in the, in the online space. And uh, some people hear that and say, that's not possible. Uh, and I understand where you are coming from. But I also want you to know there are things we are doing right now, including church, where we are meeting online. And I, if we are actually meeting for church online, I want you to expect that there are people, quite a number of people that will have to meet their future spouse uh, online. And so I'm not just, I'm not suggesting that now you go and, uh, you know, have an online presence and get an account here or there. But I'm just saying, in case you end up having an, an, an online presence, in case you end up trying to go in that uh, direction to meet somebody, make sure that you decide what you want to be your outlook 
on the, um, on the virtual space. What kind of things do you want to reveal yourself? How do you want to project your personality to other people? Um, what do you want to, uh, someone that is just browsing and looking around, that is mature and ready to get married, that is a Christian, what do, they, do you want them to see about yourself? Do, you, do they, if you have your online presence as very sensual uh, and, um, and uh, actually just, uh, you know, careless, it will project promiscuity, it will project someone that is uh, loose, and uh, it will attract some playboys and very loose girls. And I want you to understand that that is now more important because the, the, these same people are not seeing you and uh, physically, they are seeing what you have online and some of these things are pictures you took and you are just being goofy and you put them online and uh, you just wanted to know what, what. But if that is what you have there and that is the persona that you have put out there for, for people, then I want you to understand that the people that are going to be uh, coming after uh, you in that way and uh, that are going to be thinking about you and praying about uh, whether God would lead them to you, I want you to know that those are the, going to be the people that are playboys because they see what you are actually uh, put out there or lose girls if you're a man uh, that is actually projecting yourself in that manner. If you project, if you put mature, a mature online presence, you project, uh, that will project modesty, maturity, and godliness, and good naturedness, what you are probably going to attract to yourself are people that are serious with life, and probably are going to be, have a lot of potential to become uh, a future spouse. I want you to just understand that this is the reality. It's not something we asked for, but I want you to know that if you are careless about your online presence, if you are careless about how you actually uh, show yourself out there, I want you to know that that may be your mainstay. That may be the main way that you are probably going to actually be known by people. And uh, besides uh, just having an online presence there, I want you to know that it's going to be very important also that you become very savvy in um, researching and checking somebody out. Because if somebody reaches out to you uh, and you do not know how to search for people, you don't just, they don't reach out to you that way and quickly you are in prayer and quickly you are just uh, engaging yourself and making phone calls. Know how to research. Know how to check somebody out. Know how to go through all their friends and go browse through their friends and uh, just check and, and see what kind of a person they are. And, um, and make sure that you are very, very vigilant. And I just want you to know that it's just become more risky in relationships just because now what you probably have to do is going to be more virtual uh, than any other way. I also want you to know those that are already in relationships, uh, it, I know there are changes. You are, you are not meeting as often as you used to. You are being more cautious even when you meet. And I just want you to, to, to know that you have to navigate how to still keep communications uh, even when you are not meeting uh, physically as often. The other thing is because some of the open spaces where people meet in restaurants, in coffee houses, those places are no longer open. And now that pushes you to meet in houses and in rooms and in spaces where it can be more risky and more foolish uh, to be alone with somebody. I want you to know that as a single person that wants to keep their purity, you probably have to be careful how you engage yourself in some of these things. And you have to think, it has to be delivery, deliberate. You have to think through what you're going to do and how you are going to approach these issues if you are going to succeed and do well in the issue of relationships. And so I want you to understand that there are changes. Things are changing. Your approach to issues of relationship, especially the issue of meeting somebody, how you meet someone. I'm not saying how you now start the engagement and how you do courtship and how you do marriage. Marriage is not never going to be virtual. I think it will, I, I want you to understand that. And because it's never going to be virtual, if you meet somebody on the virtual space, you have to be able to now physically get to know them, get to engage with them, get to understand them more. But uh, I, I just want us to make that adjustment and I want you to be ready. And I'm not suggesting that you go all out virtually, pray about this things, and if you feel comfortable and you feel God leading you in that direction, I want you not to be careless. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing the right way. 
If it's worth doing, you cannot be careless. It's worth, if you are going to be meeting somebody in, in, a, in a restaurant or somewhere for coffee, I know you dress up, I know you prepare yourself, you think through what kind of a person you, they want you to see you as. And so if that is what you do, I want you to understand in the virtual space, there are people checking you out all the time and you have to make sure that you project what is right if you are going to be successful in that way. And so <clears throat> this is a time where because of the changes, many, many people that are single are going to consider that as a, as a way uh, where you can, you can find out more about someone that you know. And I, I pray, my prayer is that you can, you can just, just stay where among the people you know, you are not going to go to Sri Lanka and start communicating with somebody there that is a smart guru on the, on the internet that is able to, you may end up talking to, like some of the people that will be talking to someone somewhere in Africa, Nigeria, or Ghana, they are thinking that they are talking to a white lady here in, in America, and then they end up, probably they are talking with a, a 40 year old man somewhere in, a, in an apartment in the suburbs of uh, Lagos or somewhere in Accra. I want you to understand that these things are happening online. It's dangerous, and I want you to be careful how you approach that. Now, on, on the spiritual side, let me say something here that is very important for those that are uh, in relationships or those that are seeking relationships. If you go back to Genesis 24, I'm not going to turn there, but I want you to understand when this man, Abraham, that is not Genesis 24. When this man, Abraham, was, um, was preparing himself uh, to get a wife for his son, Isaac, he took Eliezer and he sent Eliezer on a journey. And he said, around here, there's not going to be a wife for my son, Isaac. I want you to go back to my land and I want you to go there. So he's sending him out to a place where he's not very familiar. He doesn't know the people there. He doesn't know the character of the people there. He has no idea what uh, the girls there do, how the, these families are. He has no history of these families. But so he's going out. And one of the things I want to highlight about the journey of Eliezer going there, he had a heightened sense of, of, um, of spiritual alertness. He, he, he went there and the first thing he was doing is prayer and saying, God, God, lead me. God, take me to the right person. God, let the person that actually is the right one do A, B, C, D. So he even included some things that we had not seen in the scriptures before this time where he says, if the person comes and they say this and they do exactly this, then I will know if they are from the house where my, my master Abraham told me to get a wife from, if they are from there, then they will be the person that God you have called for to be a wife for Isaac. So he was actually very specific but he was very spiritually alert because he did not have the advantage of time and he also did not have the advantage of data that would have helped him make a decision. So what he did is he starts arming himself spiritually. We are not told much about Eliezer before this time or even after he brings this uh, wife to Isaac. But I also want you to know that within the short time that we read about him in Genesis 24, that was probably a space of two months that we, are, we read there. In that time, this man prayed. This man seeks, sought the face of God and was saying, God, lead me to the right place. God, show me what to do. God, I'll go to the well and I'll find out who comes there first. If they come there and they are from this house where my master came from, then they are going to be the pastor. There has to be a heightened sense of uh, spiritual sensitivity that was in this man as he was going. He was probably praying all the way through as he was going on the journey. He was seeking God and whatever he was doing in this strange space that he had come or this strange land that he had come, he was doing that also listening to the voice of God. And I want to just say this to those people that have been disturbed by the quarantine, singles that are no longer talk to anybody. When you go to your working place, you have a mask on your face and you have other clothing, PPE all around you. Nobody has a chance to see you. They don't even know who you are. You feel hidden and you feel like God, nobody can see me. I don't see anybody. My I'm lost in this world of darkness. I do not know what will happen about relationships with my life. And probably your goal and your hope was that this year is when 
you are going to meet somebody, I want you to understand that in the place where we are, God is still God. The same God that has continued to supply for your needs in the quarantine, he's not just supplying for food and shelter, God is able to meet every other need undisturbed. He's not changed by the times, he's not moved by the times, he still can provide and bring you somebody, but I also want you to understand, for you to be able to navigate in this area, you have to know that it's going to be different for you. You have to be spiritually sensitive and you have to understand the way God is going to work with you. And this is what Ariaza is saying. Every other man in the town where they lived, every other man was finding a girl from the neighborhood. They knew everything about this girl. They knew how many goats the father had. They knew what the father needed. They knew how to approach things in that land. But for Isaac, it was going to be different. And that's why he needed to be spiritually sensitive. And that is what I want to give to some of the singles that are really asking themselves, I'm a Christian. I love God. I don't want to do that which is wrong. I've been waiting upon God. What about someone like me? And I, and I want you to know, even if the quarantine continues for how long, I want you to understand that God is still God. And in this time of the quarantine, if this is your time, nothing has changed in heaven. God is still able to come through and bring somebody in your life. I, I have had, an, an, uh, there, there's a gentleman among us who called me not too long ago, and he said, me and my fiance, we, are, we, we, we have decided we want to go ahead and uh, get married in this time, in this season, and then see whether later we can come back and do uh, you know, a wedding where we invite friends. But right now, we are not able to invite friends. We are not able to do uh, anything. And this is somebody who has served here for, for a very long time, for years. They have been with this church. They have been with us for a very long time. And, uh, and I was just saying to myself, I wish other people can get that vision that you don't have to wait until we are able to set up tables and uh, have a big meal. You don't know when that is going to be possible you can still do a small thing. And then uh, probably after the quarantine, we'll get all the quarantine couples and we'll probably do something to celebrate uh, that you have already come together. But I want you to know that God has not put a pause on the issues. God has not put a comma uh, on, your, on your relationship. God has not put a comma on your life. God is still God. He still continues. Even when all the places, all the spaces of worship has, have been closed, God had already put in place mechanisms where people can still continue worshiping. We are still worshiping. We are still thanking God even when we are separate in our own homes. I want you to know that God had a plan also for you and relationships even when uh, you uh, you didn't have an idea that quarantine was coming. So for those people that are single, I want you to be hopeful. I want you to be hopeful. Psalms 32 verse 8, that's the verse I want to leave you with. It says, the Lord says, I will guide you along the way. I'll guide you along the way. I'll guide you along the best pathway. I'll move you in the direction that is right for you. I will guide you along that path. And this is what Eliezer is praying. He's saying, God, guide me. God, take me to the person. I don't have to follow the norms. I don't have to go the easy way of seeing somebody. But, so, but guide me and show me and lead me in the right direction. Uh, I remember back in the day, one, one, one friend of mine, he was a Tanzanian, but he used to work in Kenya. And uh, so we, we, we met in Nairobi back in the day, back, back in the day. And uh, one of the things he, he, he said in Swahili, he always spoke in Swahili, and he said, uh, macho, macho ndio upofu wetu. And I'll translate that for you. It is, our sight is our blindness. Our physical sight is our blindness. When we think we can see is when we, we actually fail to see because we can see with our natural eyes. And, and this can be a blessing in these guys for those that are seeking relationships because you can meet a good guy, good looking, uh, fine, ready for marriage, and uh, you look at them with your natural eyes, and when you see them with the natural, you fail to seek God 
Because their physical, physique may be so overwhelming, you fail to seek God, and you fail to ask God questions, and you end up like a blind man because you did not actually see. You, when you, what you saw with your eyes became what blinded you from what God actually uh, intended for you to see if you had sought him. And so I want you to understand as uh, singles that God has a plan for your life. I want to speak quite a bit next Sunday uh, to all the singles, and, I, and I'll show you exactly what I feel, uh, and I'll pray with you uh, singles uh, that God will continue keeping that hope and that vision in your life, that nothing has changed in heaven. God has, uh, his plan is on track. And if you keep your hopes up and do not allow the enemy to discourage you, you'll probably be able to focus on the one relationship that God has given you. Some of you needed this time to be aware so that you stop seeing everybody else and stop being distracted from the relationship that God gave you. And I know some of you feel an ouch there because you know God is saying something to you. And I pray that God is going to help you. Now, for the couples, for the married couples, um, Enter quarantine uh, goodbye routine. When quarantine came in, we thought that it was going to be for one week. And we thought this is a simple thing. Let's just uh, one, two weeks. We figure out how things are, and then we will see how things go. And I even remember that even the government, the government actually, the federal government was saying, okay, we have 30 days of, uh, you know, shutdown, and then we figure out how things are. And it has continued for all this time. What changed in our families was very drastic. I do not think there is any period of time in history in our day, especially if you are alive and listening to me now, that you have ever experienced what is being experienced by families at this time. The home where everybody closed the door and left in the morning and went to work and came back, that home became the new office. It's now the new office. And God forbid if mama and daddy are both working at home. Because now there is war for office space. My job pays more, I need to have the bigger space. My job is more important, I need to be downstairs or upstairs or whatever, uh, you know, room is uh, by the corner. So the home became the new office. The, the kids were told, stay home, don't come back to school. So the home became the new school. The every kid now is at home. They have to have, you know, learning at home. And so you have to be the new. The parents became the new teachers. The kids became, um, the home became the new school. It also became the new daycare for those that have young children. And so many, many people actually thought uh, that these things uh, cannot be this way for a long time. These kids will have to go back to school. They did, never thought that as a parent, they would ever become the teacher or they would ever become the one that is actually, the dad never thought that he would take care of the kids the whole day. It's a new school, it's a new daycare, it's a new office, it also is a new church. Look at where you are. Look at where you are in your living room. Did you ever think for one day that you are going to be dancing and worshiping right in your living room. So these are things that you never thought would ever happen in your home. It's a new church. That's the new place where you do all your prayer, you do all your worship, you do all your singing, you jump in that living room. It also became the new uh, vacation destination. Many people by now have traveled, would have traveled for vacation. I remember last week, uh, last year, we were somewhere else. Uh, but now, you see, this is now the new vacation destination for the summer. The home has changed. The home is still uh, the home. So we don't leave, and some couples are doing it in a, in a very interesting way. They'll stay home, they'll work at home, but at the end of the day, they'll take a walk and then come back like they have come back from home. Now... All these things are okay, but what did they produce? They have produced increased conflict in the home. I'm thinking that someone will produce a t-shirt that will be written, my family survived quarantine 2020. And that will sell. Because quarantine 2020 has brought a lot of conflict in families. And I want you to understand, it's not that anyone is bad. It's just that this uh, my glasses and this bottle cannot be uh, hitting each other when they are that far. 
But as I bring them close, they'll be able to hit each other. And sometimes when we are physically spending most of the day apart from each other, we have no opportunity of fighting except on text messages and all that. But when we stay in the same space all day, the potential for conflict is there because we are human beings. It's not because we are bad. It's not because there's something wrong with us. It's just because we are human beings and human beings have many faults and human beings are not uniform. We are not exactly the same. And so we don't do things exactly the same. And that is, has become a source of conflict. Increased conflict has come to our homes just because of quarantine 2020. The other thing is uh, uh, very interesting. And I know I'm ste I'll step on some toes here, but bear with me, don't fight me. And I, and I, and I don't, please don't switch on the TV because uh, sometimes when you're in the church, you cannot walk out. But now you feel like uh, you can just switch me off. But this is something that has come up. There are secret addictions that now have come to light because everybody is at home. Secret addictions. Now, some men have discovered that the Amazon truck doesn't just come daily like you thought. It comes four or five times a day. Four or five times a day. It drops in a small thing here, another, they are five, six dollars, they are ten dollars. And so that, that you discover by staying at home, it was there before, dropped off another thing, and then someone goes out for a walk, comes back with another thing, and packages and packages are just coming. Then some other things. Daddy may be taking a little bit too much wine in the day. We didn't know this because he was always gone. And then he will come back late in the evening and we thought he just passed by somewhere. Oh, unfortunately, we are now discovering that this habit is not an evening habit. This habit is an all-day habit. Mom stays too much on the phone. Dad can't help himself playing video games and watching YouTube videos. This is probably something that has come to light. Some of daddy's videos are too violent and some of them need a shower. They are not clean. These are some addictions that have come to light. And I know what I'm saying is something that you can identify with because some of these things, some people are, have just, they live in the morning. When they are home, they are catches, they are good, they are kind. But because the workplace is a jungle, they are nasty all day for eight hours. And then they put another persona, they come back home. Now they are at home, but they are on the phone with workmates, and the nasty person has now started to emerge, and someone is wondering, is that really my spouse? Is he the one that is speaking like that on the phone? Is he the, the one that is making that phone call with a workmate and speaking out all those things? So some of these things have come to light. The politics of the pandemic have added stresses to marriages because the pandemic has come with its own politics. You may call them whatever they are, but they are politics. Those politics have almost wrecked homes because one has this opinion, the other one has this opinion, but their opinions are just based on the kind of videos they watch and who is sending them those videos. Because a lot of you are not involved in the political process in any way except voting. A lot of you are not involved in any way. You don't make any political decisions. And you don't have any inside information. It's all on the internet. And just depending on what you watch and what you choose to believe, many, many people actually are fighting about the politics of the pandemic. And then anxiety over money. Anxiety over money. It's not, I'm not saying you don't have money. But it's just that people have become more anxious because some people's income has remained steady. And even what they probably lost, they have been able to recover. But because they have this fear that money is scarce and because of the pandemic, a pandemic I'm not making enough money and this flow may even stop at some point, they start becoming anxious. And because they are anxious, they start now fighting about money. And then having uh, relatives, having friends, having other people who have needs, and then the politics of how do we do these things uh, has also become an issue. Parenting issues have come up, and stressed kids in the house stress weak marriages. If you have a weak marriage, this is almost wrecking you apart because 
You are thinking that the kids now have become more important and kids, taking care of kids have become more important than your marriage to your spouse. And because of that, many, many people have actually brought uh, a lot of stress upon themselves. So these are things that are real. Uh, qu the quarantine has brought these things to light. You would never have known some of these addictions, these weaknesses, the changes in your spouse. You would never have known these things except you are together in the home and except for the hours that you are spending together. But I, I just have a few biblical principles that I want to give you today that will help you in this time of the quarantine. And these are not new principles. These are old principles that need to be uh, applied in a new way. When God gave us his word, the Bible says it's tested seven times. It is completed. That means that word is going to be true any time of the year, under any circumstances, on any place on the earth. We don't have a Bible for Africa, for Asia, and a Bible for America. That means at whatever place you are, at whatever time of the year, the word of God is true and is the same. And so some of these principles of marriage, yes, some are more important at this time than others, but none, they need to be emphasized more because they apply more. But I want you to know that every single word of God is true, is true and it will help uh, your marriage survive. So marriages that are going to survive the quarantine time and are going to emerge stronger are marriages of people that are going to um, adjust themselves. Some people, the people that are able to adapt themselves. That you are, you are not just stuck in your ways. You are not just going to do what you want and what you feel like you want to do. That you are going to make sure that what you are doing and what you intend to do in your life is going to be according to the word and you, you want to make sure that it is going to be important for the time that we are living in. For example, the word, say, the word of God says that you think also about others and not just about your own needs. And elevate the needs of others above the needs uh, of, of yourself. Think more highly of them than you think of yourself. And that will help you solve the problems of space in the house. If you are trying to set up two offices, then that will help you so that you are not going to go for the prime place. You are going to think what is more appropriate for my wife and what is more appropriate for me as a husband. And then set up those spaces accordingly, not according to what suits you, not where the couch is so that you can lie down on the couch when you want and pretend that you are working and you are just asking for coffees and all that. You are going to find the space that is right considering the needs of your spouse above your, your, your own needs. And so some of these principles are just important and I just want to share three of them and I know God is going to bless us. Three legs. The cord of three strands is not easily broken. There is a stool, uh, used to be more like this ship, but it had three legs. It used to, and I remember during our wedding, uh, one of our aunties gave us one of those tools, and uh, we kept it for a long time. Now we only have the picture, but that is a stool that uh, is, is very popular in Africa, where it is just a stool yeah, you can sit on, but it has three legs. It's stable. You cannot sit on that stool on two legs. We used to do that when we were younger. You cannot do that and be stable. You cannot have one leg on that stool, however big or strong, you cannot have one leg and be able to stand. It has to have three legs for it to be able to sit and uh, stand properly so that it can be strong. A marriage that is set on three legs, a marriage that is set on three is going to be able to stand in this time. And the first leg is having God as the center of your marriage. That is a God-centered marriage. And the next one is the love for your wife. And the other one is honor your husband. And I'm just going to give you these reminders very quickly uh, in our message here today. If your marriage is going to stand and be able to withstand the uh, quarantine, you have to have God at the center of your marriage. And he has to be the central cord, the main cord. That you, even if you fail in the other two, at least this one, if you get this one right, you can strengthen the others. And a God-centered marriage is as a marriage where the husband and the wife, their own personal lives are God-centered. It's not a mystery. It's not something that you go do out there. This is something that is very important that you as a husband actually desire to be more godly and to know God. And this time of quarantine, that you live a godly life in your home. 
That godliness is not when you go to church. And for many people, for many years, maybe godliness to you was going to a place called church, dressed in a certain way, doing certain things, and then go home and live the rest of your life during the week as a heathen. But if you want your marriage to succeed, you have to be God-centered in your home. The people in your house know you as a man of God, and when you walk in, they know that a godly man has walked in. And when you have your life as a God-centered and as a wife as God-centered, then you, the two of you are able to live together and your home is sweet. But if you do not have a God-centered home, selfishness takes over and all these other things that the enemy keeps throwing against his families are going to take over your marriage and are going to destroy. A God-centered marriage is going to stand where prayer, everyone has their own prayer life. Everyone has their own prayer life. It's not just husband pray for us, wife pray for us. And I remember back in the day, in most of the families that we went, the husband never used to pray. The husband never used to read in prayer. And that bothered me. And I say to myself, when I get married, I will make sure that I'm the one who leads prayer in my home. And so, if we are praying for food, I pray. If we are going somewhere, I pray. I'm the one who will say the communal prayer when we are doing something in prayer. Of course, I'll give the children some chances, and sometimes my wife will also pray. But I want you to understand, primarily, I have taken that role, and I lead there, and that is what every man needs to do. And in those days, the wife is the one who was always told, and sometimes they wouldn't even call it prayer, that when the food is laid on the table, and there are some visitors here, so we have to pray for the food, then the husband would say, hey, have you dropped the flag on this one? Have you brought down the flag? That means when you bring down the flag, then we can all go ahead and eat. Because when the flag is still up, everyone is on attention. But when now the flag comes down, everyone moves ahead and they do their thing. And so prayer was just something like, we are now, you know, stuck until you pray and then we can do our own thing. I want you to understand, a God-centered marriage is going to succeed. It is going to thrive in this time. And this is going to be the best season for a God-centered marriage because the two of you that have developed their character, have developed godliness in them, the fruit of the Spirit is in you, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, those things are working in your life. Those are going to be expressed in the family and that family is going to get richer and better. A family that also makes decisions considering what God says is a God-centered marriage. It's a family that makes every decision based on what God speaks and based on what God says, that marriage is going to be able to stand. That marriage will be victorious. That marriage is going to bear fruit because it's based on God's will. And when we have God's will at the center of the marriage, then we are not going to fail. That's why when two, two people have two different wills, and they have two different wills, and they don't have a common place where their wills merge and they agree on one thing, and that is the will of God, those marriages will always have conflict. And if they don't, because there are so many people that are doing great in marriage, they are seen as doing well in marriage, they end up retreating to a life where you live your own personal life, you live your own personal life, and then together, we, but we just live in the same house, and we share quite a number of benefits, but we are just in the same house, but uh, we are, our lives are not together. I want to just say to you, if your marriage is God-centered, your marriage is going to succeed. If you allow God to be the centerpiece of your marriage, decisions are made with him, you consider him, you pray, you ask him to guide you, then you are going to succeed in your marriage. That is the first leg. The second leg of this tool is, um, is honor, respect for the husband, respect for that man. Now, familiarity breeds contempt. We know that. And so when you're seeing somebody in the morning, noontime, and in the evening, and you see them throughout the day, the, the, the excitement disappears. You feel like they have nothing new to tell you because they've been with you all day. And, and, uh, and the blessing that was that people would leave the house and not see each other most of the day. And then come back later in the evening 
Everyone has an exciting experience that they saw there and their mind was exposed to all this new data. They come home excited and they are eager to tell stories about what happened out there. That, that, that is had its own blessing. That was a blessing and that was good. And now that has been taken away by the quarantine. And what now is left is I'm seeing you all day. And most of the time, especially when people are working in the house, uh, people just wear their pajamas, they are in pajamas all day, all week, and especially maybe the same pajamas because many people don't wear uh, different pajamas. So you, we are looking at this person and wondering, whatever happened to me? What happened to life? And, um, but sometimes when people dress up and they look nice, they are going out, yeah, you're looking good, and, and then you walk out. Uh, that kind of creates some energy in the marriage, and that helps a marriage. I want you to understand that these subtle changes that have come in can breed contempt for your spouse, can breed that thing where you don't recognize them anymore, you don't see them anymore, and I want you to be aware of that. I want you to know that the honor that God says be there for the husband, if that is missing, in a marriage, then you will have problems inside your marriage. We have an example. This is Sarah. Sarah is commended in the New Testament, and she's commended for her faith. She is the wife of Abraham. They feared God. They had a God-centered marriage. Their marriage was God-centered. Now, but Sarah's uh, commendation comes from her faith and her submission. We talk about her submission, but I also want to understand, you to understand, Sarah was a woman of faith. Sarah was a woman of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 11. I want you to hear what the Bible says. By faith, Sarah herself also conceived, uh, re also received strength to conceive seed. So, this is not Abraham. Abraham had faith for Isaac. But Sarah had her own faith. And because of her faith, she conceived, she received the strength to conceive because of her faith and not because of the faith of Abraham. And the Bible says, and she bore a child when she was past the age because, this is the reason, he ju she judged him faithful who had promised. So her faith was that God who promised me is able to make my body strong again and my body can, can conceive and my body can receive seed and be able to conceive. She had faith. She's a woman of faith. But I also want to show you the second character that is in 1 Peter uh, 3 verse 5 to 6. It says, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Now, that is something you need to underline. Being submissive to their own. Not, not being submissive to husbands. Their own husband. So this is not an issue of men and women. Women submit yourself to men. That is not in the Bible. That is not scriptural. It is wife submit yourself to your own husband. And Peter repeats the same in Ephesians chapter 5. And it's so easy for many ladies, many wives to submit to other people's husbands and to show honor to them and to show respect to them. It's so easy for them to do that. But the guy you are familiar with, this dude who married you, sometimes it becomes difficult to just honor them and respect them. But he says, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Some people say, oh, not me. Calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you, are, if you do good, are not afraid with terror. I'll come back to that. But I also want you to understand, faith and submission there, uh, Peter tells us these two things go together. Faith, submission, they go together. Where there is little faith, there's not going to be submission. So, and so I, can do, I can actually define submission in another way as having faith that God is working through the leadership of my husband to accomplish what is best for me and him. So God is working through the leadership of my husband. I believe that. I may be smarter than him. I may have gone to school more. I may be making more money. But believing and saying, God is wiser than me. There's something he put in this guy. There's a leadership aspect in this guy. And so I'll follow his lead. I'll endorse his leadership. 
I'll stand with him. And when you do that, and when that is in place in a marriage, that marriage is going to succeed. I know all the knives are out, and I just want you to know that that is the word of God, and I cannot change it. I cannot edit it. I just have to give it the way it is. And this word has worked all the time, all these years. That's how marriages have been working. Those strong marriages were, were actually were run this way. But now, because the Western culture has infiltrated every culture in the world, that's why we see the decadence and the destruction of the marriage institution the way it is. Because we have come with our own wisdom, we do what is right, we do what is logical, what is reasonable, and when we do that and fail to see the word of God, we fail to see the wisdom of the tested word of the creator, and that has destroyed the marriages, uh, marriages in a big way. And I want you, just, you to just know that maybe whatever is needed to make your marriage survive is in this little thing here where you say, I will believe God that whatever he puts in the mind of the leadership of this man, I'm going to follow that and I'm going to actually submit myself to it. And uh, so let me uh, say something here. And I just want to say Sarah, Sarah's name was Sarai before uh, God changed it. Sarai means princess. And it was not a mockery princess. This woman was beautiful. Genesis 12, verse 11 to 14. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. This is the husband. Calls you and says, Hey, I know you are a woman of beautiful... This, she's 60 at this time. I know you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Some of you would be saying, What do you want? What, what do you want? The way you are studying, this, what do you want? Because I have not heard you say that in a long time. Indeed, I know you are a woman of beautiful country. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, that I may live because of you. So he's saying, tell them you are my sister, so uh, they, they will not uh, kill me. So it was when Abraham came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. You see, because Abraham sees her as beautiful, then everybody else sees her as beautiful. She is 60 at this time. So I want you to understand that this woman, Sarah, or Sarai, was a beautiful woman. This woman was a very intelligent woman. She was a woman of faith, but she was able to submit until in the scriptures we are given her as an example of what submission is. Many women struggle with this issue of submission. And they end up sabotaging God's plan for their marriage. And then when you leave that home, and when you throw your, your husband out on the cab, and you feel like I've now done what you know someone that is in charge and in power is able to do, you come to realize that what I did was wrong. This is not, was not God's plan for my marriage. I want you to understand that submission, the example we are given by Sarah, is going to be key if your marriage is going to survive quarantine. Let me tell you this. At least when everybody left the house in the morning, there was a pressure valve that was released from morning till evening until you come back. Now during quarantine, I want you to know that lack of submission is going to increase pressure and pressure and pressure inside the marriage, and that can be a destructive aspect of your marriage. Let me uh, jump a lot of things and uh, just talk a little bit about Abraham. Abraham. Abraham risked his life. Um, and uh, the integrity of his wife made so many mistakes as a husband, and um, he is actually a husband that has not many things that we can emulate as a husband. But there's something I want to point out to you that is important in Abraham and Sarah that is important for you husbands. Love your wife. A marriage will not survive if it's not God-centered, if there is no respect for your husband, whatever else you put into it, it's not going to survive. But marriage will not survive and it's not going to be a sweet experience if there is no love for the wife. If you do not show love, I know you say, I love her, that's why she's married to me. But if you do not show it in tangible ways, practical ways, then your marriage is not going to survive. And this is the one thing that Abraham did right. He loved the wife even when they went through the challenges that they went through. I want you to understand that loving your wife 
is going to make your marriage survive and it's going to be very important uh, for the ongoing, uh, going forward of your marriage. Uh, this is going to be important. Let me, let me, let me point out something about, uh, so that we can balance the issue of uh, submission. Listen to your wife. If you love your wife, let me just start off by saying, listen to her. In Genesis 21, verse 12, the Bible says, But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the Lord or because of your bond woman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, this is God saying, Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. In my culture, they told us different. In my tribe, they say different about wives. And all of you men that are from my culture, from my, my tribe, and from my place, you know that this is what they say. I also know other tribes, many of them, where in your culture they say, don't listen to a woman. This one is so foolish, he listens to his wife. That is something we had growing up. And that is completely wrong according to scriptures. God himself is saying, Abraham, listen to Sarah. Listen to her voice. Listen to her voice. And he says, for in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Here Abraham is just about to walk into a trap. He's had a, a child with a, with a maid. That she, Hagar is baby mama. And because of the emotional attachment, he's about to make a decision that is going to sabotage God's plan for his life and the future of Israel and the future of the kingdom. And Sarah here is in the right spot, doing the right thing. Sarah, who is a submissive woman, has a voice and is speaking in the tents of Abraham and is saying, this bond woman is not going to live here with my... And so you have to understand submission, the way God sees it, doesn't mean that you don't have a voice as a wife. You have a voice, you can speak, you can veto things, you can say, but also with a, an attitude of submission. So many husbands do not listen to their wives. I want you to understand this is important. God says, listen to the voice of your wife. Now, wives, I know you are high-fiving and amening, but I want you to hear this. It does not say, obey your wife. That is not what is said. Listen to her voice. It doesn't, there's nowhere the Bible says that you obey your wife. And what that means is, listen to her, that means ask, consider her opinion, Ask for her input, ask for her opinion, and if it's right and godly, follow it. But it doesn't, does not mean that everything she says you have to do as she says. She has leadership, she has energy, she has potential, she has capabilities just like you have. In and if you are careful. So I want you to understand, Abraham was expressing uh, that I know you are a woman of beautiful countenances, Genesis 12. I know you are a woman of beautiful countenance. I know these guys may want to kill me because of you. And so tell them you are my sister. So when you see beauty in your wife, then I want you to understand when you see that beauty, then, um, then, then the, the other people tend to see it. Other people tend to commend. Other people t tend to, to commend you because when you are seeing that goodness in her life, other people see her the way you see her. And I want to just say to uh, all of you men, I just want you to say you have to find new quarantine ways of expressing that you care for your wife. They are, they are crying for it. They are yearning for it. They are wondering whatever happened. Uh, and uh, and uh, have you ever, have, has your husband or wife ever traveled and they travel for a few days. Maybe they, they do trucking. Maybe they also, you know, they do another job and they travel in this job. And uh, they travel for two or three days. Or they go to somewhere for two or three days without you. It's always exciting when you are looking forward to them coming back home. So it's always exciting. And so what quarantine has taken away from us is that hopeful expectation every single day that you are waiting to meet your spouse because most of the day probably you are still with them and you are interacting with them. I want you to not discount the value of that exit and coming back, but I want you to adjust yourself. I want you to adapt yourself that there is a way that you are going to be deliberate and remind yourself that it is important for you as a husband to express love 
and not just the physical admiration, but also the sacrificial love of God to be expressed by your mouth. It's very important. And it's also important that sacrificial love expressed also by actions, that in your house, you are going to help. And let me give you a tip, wives. And this is probably the last thing I'm going to tell you wives today. Instead of telling your husband, hey, you don't help around the house. You, since this, you don't help anywhere around the house. Instead of saying that, can you teach yourself to say something like, can you do dishes every other day for me? Don't, don't leave all the other stuff out. All the other condemnation, you don't do this, you don't. Don't be general. Just be specific. Say, can you help me with dishes every other two weeks? Husbands, instead of fighting and saying, uh, I don't eat anything, any, yeah, I'm just tired of this. And, and you are adding words that are not even coming uh, from your heart. The devil takes over. I want you to just say something like, I would want to eat a hot breakfast every day. I know you, you want to sleep in. I know you probably are getting on the phone call very early in the morning. But I can cook for myself. But if you make me breakfast, that will make me happy the whole day. And so as opportunity comes, then you tend to get breakfast. If you want help with the children, say what you want. Don't come with general comments and condemnations and you know, manipulative words trying to push somebody to guilt. Be direct and say, hey, if I can get some help, please give me help with the children. If you watch the children for these two hours, I'll be able to prepare as a dinner. And that direct, especially men, they want a direct request. If you make a direct request, many of them have no, they will not say no. And sometimes you make that direct request and, it's, and make a big request. They look like a deer that is on headlights. They don't know where to go. You say, can you do the dishes and also clean the floor for me today? Thank you. And uh, they have no idea. They will find their mouth saying yes. And you get better results with that. And I just want to advise and encourage all of us that this time God has given us for qu this quarantine time, this time, let's make the best of it. Let quarantine be the time where you reset your marriage and rebuild it. We do not know how long it's going to be. But I want to just encourage you, as you emerge out of this time, emerge out of it stronger. Your marriage doesn't have to be destroyed. And I want to give you another, another statistic. It's not that marriages have been destroyed by this. I've read many stories of people that are saying, I wanted to leave. I was reading a story where one lady was saying she was ready to go. The only thing she had not figured out is housing. And then quarantine happened. And after quarantine, she ended up stuck with this person. They... <laughs> Uh, was going to be the future ex, and uh, she, was, she ended up being stuck in the house with this person, and for the time that she was stuck there with this person, she had come to figure out what a mistake she would have done, the mistake of her life. And now their marriage is thriving and doing well. Don't listen to all these stories of so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Some of these marriages were just cruising downhill. They were just going downhill. It has nothing to do with quarantine. The quarantine has, yes, brought some adjustment, but quarantine should be a time where we emerge out of uh, quarantine with better marriages, stronger, and because pressure actually makes, uh, you know, diamond. Pressure actually makes some precious things. I want you to understand that that pressure that your marriage is going through is probably going to, uh, to get jewels out of your spouse and out of your marriage, and that marriage is going to bring glory to God. Abraham loved Sarah, even through the challenges of barrenness, the challenges of old age, the challenges of being in a fallen land, the challenges of having to figure out what to do uh, without Isaac, the challenges of an old son who had refused to marry. They lived out those challenges. They were able to figure things out, and they were able to live out their life in a good way. Even when Hagar and her son were trying to batter and destroy their marriage, because Hagar tried and uh, she did try to fight with this marriage, I want you to understand that they stood. And I want you to know that God has a plan for your marriage. God will make your marriage better. If you really feel that your marriage is going through a very rocky situation and it needs help, don't give up on it. We have counsel. We have counsel. We will give you counsel. We have several, three different avenues where you can get counsel outside of the church. 
And we can send you to three different people, professionals that are going to give you counsel, pastors that are going to help you. And we can also do the counseling if we have to. But I want you to know that there is help. Do not let your marriage go down. Your marriage can do better. Your marriage can develop. It can grow. It can become everything God wants it to become. 